praise God. Um, let's open the Word of God. Now, I want to start talking tonight in the area of grace. I think I mentioned to you that I passed through Singapore on the way home from Myanmar. I did that on purpose because I wanted to go to a great church there uh, called New Creation Church, pastored by Joseph Prince. And you might have heard um, Cole Stringer talking about it. Anybody remember Cole talking about his, his most favourite church in the world? In fact, I think he's there. He's going there quite soon. He takes groups of pastors there just for the experience. And he's invited me to go next year too, which is cool. Um, but Joseph Prince is known around the world um, for preaching a very radical message on grace. He's been uh, come under a lot of flack for people that like a bit of law mixed in with their grace. And um, he's written a couple of really, really good books. Christy and I are both reading his books at the moment. I'm reading one called Destined to Reign. And Christine's reading one called uh, Unmerited Favour, which is what grace is. And it's quite revolutionary stuff. And so tonight I just want to turn us to Romans 5.17. Just start off in Romans 5.17. It's kind of like a favourite scripture for me. And I think it might be for Joseph Prince as well, because he, uh, he opens his book up on it. Romans 5.17, it's just such a... Just such a verse that uh, is so clear-cut, says something very powerful. It tells us how um, to reign in life. So Romans 5.17 says, For if by the one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. And I've always loved and enjoyed that verse because I... I love, I love victory. I love victory talk. And that verse says very clearly that we are destined to reign in life. And um, that's what God has for us. Whether we're experiencing that kind of victory now, it doesn't matter. Um, God's will is for us to reign in life. And that verse tells us how. It says by a lot of hard work and sweat and tears and fasting and prayers. No, it doesn't say that, does it? No, it says, it says two things. There's two very key things. It says, if by one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Now you can't add to the scripture and you can't take away. That's why I love this verse. It says two things. If we receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, then we are going to reign in life. End of story. Okay. And so if we're not reigning in life, then we know where to look. It's going to be in one of those uh, two areas. Now, I've preached a lot on um, the gift of righteousness. I guess that's probably the part of this verse I've leaned towards the most. And, um, but I haven't leaned so much on the other part, which is receiving the abundance of grace. And I certainly believe in grace. And uh, I've talked about it from time to time. But I feel like God's taking me personally through a grace revolution. And uh, reading this book of Joseph Prince has really opened my eyes to some things about grace and uh, grace is quite a staggering thing because it's it's unearned it's undeserved and it's unmerited okay if you earned it or deserved it it's not grace okay and the thing for us human beings is that um, when Adam fell and man became a fallen creature um, grace was not natural anymore okay grace was not natural um, when Adam was in the right place with God in the garden, then grace was very natural. He, he knew exactly what grace was about. He lived by the unmerited favor of God. There was no law. There was no rules except for a couple of things in the garden. So Adam knew what it was like to just continually receive from God all the time. God was his life source. And Adam just knew that that's the way it was supposed to be. He just received and received and received. But of course, when, uh, when man fell, then... God was not able to communicate with man the same as he could before. You know, he couldn't just have that sort of hardwired spirit to spirit communication like he used to. And so God had to deal with us by covenant and every covenant had a law attached to it. And so the way God chose to communicate with us because we we're in a fallen state and we we're very aware of our five physical senses was through law. And the flesh understands law. Okay? Our flesh is very aware of law. You know, do this, don't do that. We, we understand that in the carnal nature. 
And so the Old Covenant was all about God communicating to us through the letter of the law. And, it was, and we'll look at some more scriptures on this later. But when we came back into the New Covenant, once Jesus had come, then that all changed. Law was no longer necessary. And now we come into this New Covenant of grace. Okay? Law was all about what you could do. And grace was all about what he did for us. Okay? And so my point with that is that even now that we are born again, because we still have some old thinking, grace is not natural to us. We still have trouble receiving something for nothing. You know, oftentimes you know this yourself. You give something to another Christian. Oh, I couldn't possibly take that. It's kind of this, sometimes we call it a false humility. You know, I'm not worthy. I haven't done anything to deserve that. You know what? You ever come across people like that? Don't try that on me because I'll say yes, thank you very much. No false humility here because I've learned to receive. But a lot of people have trouble just receiving because they think, well, something inside of them says, well, I haven't worked for it. I don't deserve it. You know? Or if you give it to me, then I need to repay you. If you give me a gift, then I'm going to give you a gift tomorrow. It's just so what, that's what comes more naturally to us than grace. You understand that? And so when we're in this new covenant of grace where it's unearned, undeserved, and unmerited, you know, from my own experience, this, this takes a little bit of work. <laughs> this takes a bit of revelation to actually come to a place and realize that there's nothing that I need to do. God's already done it. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. He didn't say I am finished. He says it is finished. He said the work is done. He said you don't have to work when it comes to your salvation, your healing, your prosperity, your deliverance. You don't have to work for any of those. You don't have to work to establish your identity. All of those things are a free gift to us. And so we have to come to a place where we can receive not just grace, but the abundance of grace. Okay? And the gift of righteousness. Drop down to verse um, 21, Romans 5, 21. It said, That as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, So in the old covenant, sin was king. Sin reigned. Man was fallen. The law was there. The law was right. The law was holy. The commandments. But man was not able to keep it. And the Bible says that sin takes its opportunity through the commandment. Okay? But in the new covenant it says that grace might reign through right standing to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? So sin no longer reigns over us who are born again, but God's grace should be the thing that is now reigning in our life. Okay? Now, how many know that the, the letter of the law will not help you overcome anything? We've all tried it. Hab we've tried to kick habits by willpower and by trying to measure up to a standard. It doesn't work. We've all tried. It doesn't work. But come down to Romans 6 verse 14 and look at the scripture here. Romans 6 verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You notice that? It says, he's talking now to born again believers. He said, sin shall not have dominion. It shall not reign over you anymore as a believer. Why? Because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Okay. What does that mean? It means that grace has the power to stop you sinning. Wow. The law does not. Mm. Okay. In fact, just the opposite. The law really exposes sin. Okay. And that's why the law was brought. In fact, let's, let's give you a couple of scriptures that tell us uh, the purpose of the law. I think if we go back to Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, let's see why the law was brought in in the first place. Romans 3, 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Or another word for guilty is accountable before God. Okay, So that's one reason the law was given, is that the whole world may be brought to account. Because the whole world fell into sin, through Adam's sin. Okay, So 
the law was given as a standard not to try and make us holy, but to make us realize that when it comes to accounting, then it doesn't stack up. We, we, we fall short. Okay, we've got the law there, and we've got fallen man here, and we fall short of the law. Okay, that's why the law was given, to give us that realization, not to make us perfect, but to make us realize that we had fallen short of the glory of God. Now, verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be declared righteous in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, so once again, there's not one person alive who is able to attain their own righteousness by doing good stuff, trying to appease God, you know, trying to um, live by the letter of the law and not break the commandments. There's not one person alive who was able to do that. They might have been able to do it outwardly, but they couldn't do it inwardly. Okay, now take the Pharisees. They they figured that they had got this thing down. They figured that, man, we've got all these commandments. We're doing it outwardly. But what did Jesus say? He said, well, what about if you look at a woman to lust after her in your heart? You've committed adultery. What if you have hatred and bad feelings towards your brother? You've committed murder. And so even if you could keep the law on the outside, nobody could on the inside. Nobody except Jesus, that is. Okay? So the law was not given to make us perfect. It was given to show us how imperfect we were and how much we needed Jesus. Now let's go to Galatians 3, and we'll just give you the third, third reason there. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, round about, um, we'll read it from verse 23. Galatians 3, verse 23. It says, But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be declared righteous by faith. Okay, so we were never ever going to receive righteousness by keeping the works of the law. Okay, what was the purpose? The law was our tutor. Now, another word for tutor is guardian. And in the Hebrew culture, um, the parents would often have a guardian to raise their children. They'd go out to work, mum was busy, dad was off doing business, and so they'd have a guardian often come to the home, and his job was to groom up those children to become like the parents, etc. And so in that sense, the law was our guardian. Why? To bring us to Christ so that we could be declared righteous by faith, not by working not by the works of the law. Okay? So you can see here a little bit, we, we looked at three things. This was the purpose the law was given, and none of it said it was given so that we could be made perfect. It was to really show us how imperfect we were and to set the stage for Jesus to come in and reveal his righteousness to us as a gift. So let's turn now to uh, turn right and go to Hebrews, Hebrews uh, chapter 8. So the old covenant was the law, and the new covenant is a covenant of grace. This is really important teaching because um, so many Christians are actually living under the law. And they might say, well, I, I, I believe in the grace of God and I live under the grace. But you only need to live under the law in one point. And the Bible says you might as well live under the whole law. If you're going to live by the law in one point, then you might as well just try and keep the whole law. But you can't. Okay, so it's really important for us as believers, we've got to get a hold of this grace message. And I think we have to a certain extent, but there's, there's always levels of revelation. And so I'm going through a bit of a revolution myself, just realizing some things. Now, let's pick it up in Hebrews 8, chapter 7, talking about the covenants. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. All right. So even God himself knew that the Old Testament was not perfect. God himself knew that the Old Testament law would not make anybody perfect. So God knew that, but he had another plan. Because finding fault, verse 8, with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, and I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, 
because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. And that's the way it was in the Old Testament, man. If you didn't keep the law, if you didn't keep the covenant, bad luck. <laughs> God wasn't interested. He said, these are the terms. You keep them and I'll do my part. But if you don't, I'll disregard you. And that's exactly what happened. It was pretty harsh. But that was the reality of the sin nature. God could not work through man's sinful nature like he could before Adam fell. And so verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor or none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. You get that? I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So he, God is revealing here that there's a new covenant, a better covenant, where he will be merciful to our unrighteousness and our sins and lawless deeds. He says, I will not remember anymore. So God no longer keeps account of our sin. You know, sometimes as believers, we're like, okay, well, I got born again. I understand God has forgiven my sin. But now that I know better, you know, isn't it a bit different now? Aren't I a bit more accountable for my sin kind of thing? And it's like, I understand you, God forgave me of all my sins before I got saved. But, but what about my presence? What about future sin? You know, what, what happens there? And somebody pointed out the fact that, you know, when Jesus went to the cross, all of our sin was future. Think about that. When Jesus was on the cross and we weren't even physically here yet, all of our sin, our whole life was, was future tense. And so Jesus has died not only for our past sins, but for our future sins as well. Does that make sense? And so basically when it comes to the new covenant, God has given us the gift of righteousness, okay? And he's forgiven our sin and he no longer brings it to mind. No longer does. That's not the way he works under this new covenant. Let's go over to um, John chapter 16. This is a, a very liberating message, John chapter 16. We're going to have to probably undo some things that we've maybe even believed in or partially believed in so that we can take this thing to a new level. It's just some habits and some think, mindsets that we have. John 16, let's look at this and uh, let's look at verse 7 first of all. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. And, uh, you know, people will be very quick to say, well, see, the Holy Spirit was sent to convict us. And so as a believer, when I commit kind of, some kind of sin, then the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to hone in on that and he's going to convict my heart so that I can repent from that sin and restore the broken fellowship to God. But you know what? None of that's true. We thought it was, but it's not. Because you've got to read that carefully. It says, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. It didn't say he'll convict the believer. No, he comes to convict the world of sin. Why? Just like the law, so that they know that they have need of Jesus. Okay? You've got to get somebody lost before you can get them saved. And so the work of the Holy Spirit towards the unbeliever is to bring a conviction that, hey, I'm a sinner. I'm part of Adam's fallen generation. Therefore, I need a savior. I need to be restored. Okay. But what does the next one say? It says, and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Verse 9. And now you've got to understand that the only sin... It doesn't say sins. It says the only sin that God is, is holding against the world is the sin of unbelief. He's not racking up. He's not listing all their sins and saying, well, this is, this is what's wrong with your life. He's saying, no, no, no. Jesus has taken away the sin of the world. Okay? 
The only sin I'm holding against you is you don't believe in the finished work of Jesus. You don't believe what Jesus did on the cross. So that's why the Holy Spirit will come to convict. But then it says he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness. Um, verse 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Now he's talking to his disciples. Okay. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So obviously he's talking to the disciples then. He's not talking about the world anymore. He's talking to his disciples. He said the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin. But then he's saying, really, he's saying that the Holy Spirit comes to convict the believer of his righteousness. You see that? It's different, isn't it? Okay. And now here's how it works. When you and I fail, as we're prone to do, we do something wrong, we, we let ourselves down, we let the team down, whatever happens, we kind of have this mindset, man, the Holy Spirit has come to convict me of my sin. But you know what? He doesn't. He comes right then to remind you who you are. He comes to remind you that you're a son of God, that you're a child of God. And I can back that up with Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. You see? Now, why doesn't the Holy Spirit come to convict us of our sin? Well, first of all, he doesn't need to. We know when we've sinned. Okay? And God knows how quick condemnation will jump in when we've sinned. Why? Because we've got an accuser. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren. So we don't need the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin because the accuser comes along to condemn us when we sin. Mm. All right. And so what's God's response to that? Does he send the Holy Spirit to agree with the enemy, the yes, you've sinned? No. He sends the Holy Spirit to lead us into all the truth that I'm a child of God, mm. that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, that I'm a son of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. You see? And why? He says, no, he says, I want you to come boldly to my throne of grace to receive grace and mercy in a time of need. Now, isn't that a little bit different to what we've believed? You know? And because we've believed that, it's, that, it's like condemnation has kind of intertwined itself with this whole thing of the Holy Spirit is convicting me of sin. Now, one, another reason the Holy Spirit won't convict you of sin is because your sin has been put away. Okay? God no longer imputes sin to you. Okay? Jesus has totally removed your sin, past, present, and future. So if he's removed it, then he's not going to charge you with it. Let's go to Romans uh, chapter 4. You start to get hold of this? Romans chapter 4. This will completely liberate us from any sin consciousness. Because sin consciousness is what ruins uh, our confidence in our faith life. And so many Christians are struggling with a sin consciousness. And the more conscious you are of sin, the more you try to fix yourself with the letter of the law, guess what? It's a downward spiral. You just put yourself back under the old covenant. Jesus might not as well not have died on the cross for you. You're just trying to work it out yourself in your own strength. That's not grace. Grace is unearned, undeserved, and unmerited. That's what makes it grace. Now let's look at Abraham. Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was declared righteous by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Okay, if Abraham got a great reputation because he kept the law so well, he would have something to boast about, but not before God. He could boast before his fellow man, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness or it was credited to his account, if you like. It was given to him as a deposit in his bank account. Because why? Because he believed God. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Did you get that? When you work for something, you receive wages. And wages is not grace. Grace comes because you didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. It was unmerited. Okay? So to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who declares righteous the ungodly, his faith 
is accounted for righteousness. Now get these next few verses. Just as David, King David in the Old Testament, also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Now how many could just say right there that I'm that person? I'm that person. God, I am blessed because God imputed righteousness to me apart from my own works. How many could say that's me? I'm that person. Okay. In other words, I did not earn my salvation. It was the gift of God. I did not earn my right standing before the Father. I could not. It came as a gift from Jesus Christ. Now look at these next two verses. This is describing us now. It says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And that word covered is a, a bad translation. In the New Testament, there's no such thing as covered anymore. It's removed. The word is remission. The Old Testament was all about covering up. The blood of animals would cover your sins for a year. And then the high priest would come around the next year and offer blood again to cover the sins of Israel. So that was what atonement is, to cover. But in the New Testament, it's not an atonement. It's a remission. It's completely removed. Jesus became sin with our sin, that we might become righteous with his righteousness. So blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are are remitted, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And that's talking about you and me. Isn't that an awesome thing? God will not impute sin to us anymore under the new covenant. But what if I sin? God will not impute that sin against you. Why? Because Jesus took it. Grace has been given to you. And we think, man, I don't deserve that. That's why it's called grace. Unearned, unmerited, undeserved. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. You know, this sort of stuff just makes you want to love God more, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And you think, God, this, this is grace. I don't deserve this. And you know, here's one of my, here's my deal. Sometimes I, I feel like Christians have this thing where God has to, when God looks at them, it's like he has to superimpose Jesus over the top of them. Otherwise, he can't look at them. Ever, ever thought like that or heard somebody that just thinks like that? It's sort of like, you know, God can't look at me. I'm a, I'm a rotten old sinner. So when he looks at me, he sees Jesus. Sort of like he superimposes his son sort of between me and himself. So he looks, he can just see Jesus and Jesus covers me. Anybody ever thought like that? Let's be honest. I have. I've thought like that. You know, that's not New Covenant. No, in the New Covenant, when, when God looks, he, he sees you, not through Jesus, he sees you made righteous. He's able to look at you and love you and see that you're just like Jesus. You have the same righteousness that Jesus has. And so he doesn't need to look at you through a filter no, he's able to look at you and declare you righteous. So you, you're my righteousness. Why? Because we've got the new nature in us, see? We're new creations. We've got the nature of Christ on the inside of us. Now, we're, we're obviously in Christ, okay? And that's why we've been made righteous, because we're in Christ, okay? But God is able to look at you, not through Jesus, but look at you now as you are and see his righteousness in you. Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Now, you know, some people kind of have this thing like, you know, God's still working on my life, is still improving me. And one day the Father will be able to look at me without any ashamedness of, of me being his child or anything like that. And they sort of have this deal going on that, you know, when they die, then they'll finally be made perfect. You know, you hear Christians talk like that all the time, you know. I can give you examples. I just thought of one then. But it's sort of like, you know, we've just got, we've got to keep working at this thing. And when we cross over to the other side, then it's like our salvation will then be complete. But, you know, that would be a terrible thing if that was the case. Because that would mean that God needed Satan's help to make you perfect. Because death came from Satan. God's not the author of death. Death came into the world through sin. And sin came from Satan. Okay. So if we, if we get finally perfected on the day that we die and go to heaven, 
then we'd have to thank Satan for death because death perfected us. But that wouldn't be right, would it? That would be making the cross look very cheap. That would be like saying, Jesus, you just didn't do quite enough on the cross. We need Satan's help now to complete us. You understand how people could, they would maybe not admit they'd think like that, but in reality they actually think like that, sort of in the sweet by and by. Okay? And what happens is their confidence is robbed during their earthly life to receive anything from God. You know, we had a situation recently. Um, I was just sharing uh, with a person that, you know, great people, they, they love the Lord and they've been on the mission field for a lot of years and uh, had opportunity to share some of the Myanmar healing testimonies with this guy. And I, I think he was actually getting quite interested. So, and he told, us, he told us about a lot of pains that he had in his back and shoulder, shoulder and just pains that he's obviously lived with for years and years and years. And so Christine piped up and she said, well, we'll pray for you. And um, unfortunately, the wife just chipped in and said, no, 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 that's okay. We don't, no, 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 that's fine. No, we, we don't need to be prayed for. And then later on, as we're sort of walking out to their car, he said, well, he said, I'm going to get a new frame one day anyway. And I'm thinking there's a man who thinks that it's going to cost God something for God to heal him. And he wants to be humble and say, well, I, I, I don't expect anything else from God. I know I'm forgiven. You know, God's covered me. But I, I'm not going to ask God to do anything because one day he's going to give me a new body. And see, that tells me that that man doesn't understand what Jesus did on the cross. So he's not trying to get anything from God. God's already done it. That's why it's called the finished work. His healing's already been paid for. His prosperity's already paid for. You see, it's grace, undeserved unmerited, unearned. And so what grace does is it gives us confidence before God. Now, um, come over to a little book called Titus. You might have to find your way to Timothy and keep turning right until you find Titus. Titus chapter 3. And we'll, we'll look at verse 7. Well, actually, let's look at... Um, Let's look at verse 4. Titus chapter 3 and verse 4 and then down a little bit from there. Titus 3 verse 4 says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Saviour uh, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Now get verse 7. That having been declared righteous by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see that there? That we having been declared righteous by his grace. Okay, now back to Romans 5.17. Those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. And what, what this is telling me here is that you can, you can talk a lot about righteousness and believe in righteousness, but if you don't understand the abundance of grace, then you're not going to enter into the righteousness as you should. Because it says that we've been declared righteous by His grace. You understand that? So until we understand the abundance of grace, we're not really going to enter into the righteousness of who we are in Christ Jesus. So, wow, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Now, what's the opposite of grace? Basically, law, works. Okay, So the moment we get back under the old system of works, guess what? It's not grace. And we're no longer going to appreciate that gift of righteousness either. So what I'm saying is really you cannot have one without the other. And we've probably majored more on right standing and righteousness with God. But really you're not going to experience that until you really get a revelation of the abundance of grace. The two work in hand in hand. Because we're made righteous by grace. So we, we, we've got to really come to this place where it's sort of like we enter our rest. And we finally come to a place and realize that, hey, there's, no, there's not a thing that I can do in the world to make myself any better. There's not a thing I can do to make God love me more or to make him love me less. 
there's no work that I can do to improve myself when it comes to my standing before God. Now, we were talking about, here's another probably mindset that needs to be blown out, is that people have said when, you, when a Christian sins, then he loses fellowship with God. You ever heard that? It's like you still have a relationship, but now fellowship's broken. It's sort of like, it gives us this impression that if we sin, then God sort of has to turn his back on us, that he can't look at us anymore until we sort ourselves out. Well, guess what that is? That's law. Until we sort ourselves out. See, that wouldn't be grace, would it? That wouldn't be grace. And so when we sin, guess what? We do not break fellowship with our Father. Yeah, it's, it's like our children, isn't it? Our children, we obviously have a relationship with our children. We have a, they're our offspring. But when our children do something wrong, does it break fellowship with the parent? No, it doesn't. In fact, in some ways, you know, sometimes it can conjure up mercy and compassion in your heart. Other times, we won't talk about that. <laughs> we all know we won't go there. But it doesn't break fellowship, does it? And so when a Christian sins, you know, we've got to get away from this thing that suddenly now God is displeased with me and God's turning his back on me. And until I sort myself out, God's not going to come back to the party. No, God's not like that. See, that's that old thinking, isn't it? The Holy Spirit comes to convict of sin. No, no, fellowship's not broken. Relationship's not broken. If our fellowship was broken, that would basically mean that we had been spiritually severed from God. That's the only way you can break fellowship with God is if your spirit is cut off from the Spirit of God. When you sin, you don't suddenly come out of Christ, do you? No, once you're in Christ, you're in Christ, mm. warts and all. Mm. Okay? But see, here's the thing. God doesn't see us like we see ourselves. Mm. Sometimes we're so sin conscious and so focused on our failures, so focused on the things that aren't right in our life. But you know, God doesn't look at us that way. No, he sees you as perfect. He sees you as his son, as his daughter. He loves you. He's thrilled to bits about you. Sin's not a problem to him. He's, he's put that on Jesus. It's no longer a barrier. And so when we fail, he has compassion towards us. Let's go to uh, Hebrews 4. Let's look at this part of it in Hebrews 4. Now, some people won't preach this stuff because they think if they do, then all of a sudden people are just going to run out and just start sinning all over the place. You know, man, if, if, this, if this is so easy... And I can get forgiveness so easily, you know, then, man, I'm, I'm just going to live like I want to live. And then I know I'm, I'm honky-dory. But why would you want to live that, like that after you, you get a revelation of God's grace and God's heart towards you? How, how could you possibly, after hearing a message like this, go out and start doing your own thing when, when God is drawing near with extreme grace? You, you, you just can't do it. And so Romans, uh, sorry, Hebrews 4 verse 14 says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. In other words, he was on earth, but now he's in heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. This is not talking about a negative confession or a confession of sin. This is talking about a confession of faith, who I am in Christ. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see that? How, how come Jesus never sinned? The grace of God. It wasn't that he just kept the law so perfectly. He certainly did that. But the reason he didn't sin was because of the abundance of his father's grace towards him. The love that his father had to him meant so much to him that he just didn't sin. He just was so in love with his father, he just spent all his time doing what was right in his father's eyes. Didn't have time to sin. You see that? It wasn't like Jesus went around with the law book, you know, every five minutes making sure that, you know, check, 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 yep, done everything right. No, it wasn't like that. You know it better than that. No, it's because of his extreme relationship with his father. That's what kept him away from sin. And that's what will keep you and I away from sin. 
Okay? Sin shall not have dominion over us because why? We're not under law. We're under grace. Grace is more powerful than law. Now let's look at um, John chapter 1. Let's read from just, uh, John 1 verse 14. We'll read down to verse um, 17. John 1, 14 to 17. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, this is a description of Jesus here. He was full of two things. He was full of grace and he was full of truth. What's grace? Unearned, unmerited, undeserved, but he was full of it. Why? He received it from the Father. Why did Jesus say, don't call me good because there's none good except from God? Because all the good stuff that he did was done by the grace of God. It was not done by his own goodness. It was done by the grace of God. He said, don't call me good because the goodness I do didn't come from my own effort. It came from the grace of God. You see that? John bore witness of him and cried out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me. For he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. Well, what, man, if you're going to have a confession going this week, I challenge you to confess that over your life. Of his fullness, I have received and grace upon grace. You notice that? I have received. Not I'm receiving. I have received. I have received his grace. Now, verse 17 is the key verse. It says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now I want you to see a big difference between the law being sent through Moses, sort of like third party, but grace and truth came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, God didn't just send the law through a third party called Moses. No, in the New Covenant, He came to us. Grace and truth came through a person. See, it's no longer about a law, it's about a real person. His name is Jesus. Okay? Grace came to us in real form, something we could touch and smell and taste okay, and handle. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It was given to us. Now, let me just give you a little illustration between um, law and grace. Just say, for example, you're a, you're a corporate person, a business person, and you're going overseas on a, on a business trip. And, uh, and the, the business over in, let's say it's over in China or something like that, they email you and um, give you all the do's and don'ts and that kind of thing. And so you get to the airport in China and um, you've got all the directions. You rent a car and you get out on the highway. You turn out from the airport and you're on this great big long highway. And so you just have this urge to just bury your boot a little bit. Long straight road, no cars around. So bang, you're up through the gears, bury your boot, and you're doing 120, 130, 140 k's in no time. And all of a sudden, there's a red lollipop on the side of the road that says 80. Now all of a sudden, you've just become aware of the law. And up before that point, you were pretty happy cruising along, doing what you wanted to do. But as soon as the law came, you knew straight away, now I'm a lawbreaker. Okay? And you had to make a choice. I can either continue to do 130 and risk the consequences of breaking the law. And if I get pulled over by a law enforcement officer, he's going to quote that lollipop sign. Did you see that sign? It said 80. You're accountable to that, and I'm going to charge you according to what that said. Or the person can think, right, okay, now I know the law. I'm going to do my best to do, to do 80 kilometres. But the fact is that that lollipop sign on the side of the road has no power to cause the driver to keep the law. It has absolutely no power. It can kind of, it can draw a line and say, yep, this is the law. You should keep to that. But it has absolutely no power over that driver to cause him to slow his car down. It has no power at all. And that's what it is with the old covenant. It has absolutely no power to help us keep the law. It was just merely to show us that, hey, we're breaking the law. That's what we do before we're born again. We break the law. We're lawbreakers. We're sinners. We have the old nature in us. But now let's look at, uh, a different scenario, same person. But now this time, he comes to China and uh, he takes his suitcases out to the pickup area 
and there's a limousine there. Somebody gets out, opens the door, ushers him into the limousine. Here, can I have your suitcase? Puts it in the boot for him. He gets to sit in the limousine. There's, there's food, there's drinks, all that sort of stuff. And the driver of that limousine has a faultless record. He's been driving for 35 years. He knows, knows the city like the back of his hand. Never had a speeding ticket, never had a parking ticket, never broken the law. He's just done everything perfectly. And so the guy gets into the limousine and the driver takes off and he's taken to his destination. He's given first class treatment all the way. Now, that's a picture of grace. It is impossible now for that man to break the law. Why? Because he's not driving. And see, this is the deal. Jesus has to be in the driving seat. Because when you and I are driving, it's still possible for us to break the law. It's still possible for us as a believer to get back under works. But if we allow grace to take the driver's seat, it is impossible for us to break the law. Because we're not looking at us now, we're looking at Jesus, who fulfilled the law perfectly, full of grace and truth. Okay? And I'm in Christ. But see, the moment I get back into that driver's seat, then I have the potential to break the law again. But if I let him drive, it's impossible for me to break the law. Really? It's fulfilled in Christ. He's perfect. He's never going to break the law. Just like that limo driver, he's got a perfect record. Mm. It's not going to happen. You see that? Mm. That's a picture of grace. And that's what Jesus has done for you and I. And look, the Bible says, let's go back to our scripture as we finish off. Romans 5.17. What, 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 is the, what is this great effort that we must do to reign in life? What is this really tough thing that we are asked to do to reign in life? Let's read it again. Romans 5, 17. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, that was Adam's gift to us, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So what do we have to do? We have to receive. That's all we have to do. That's all God asks. He said, believe and receive. Believe. Believe this gospel that sounds good, too good to be true. Just believe it and receive it. And sin will not have dominion over you because you're no longer under law, but you're under grace. Isn't that awesome? Can we do that? Can we receive continually? And I believe it's, it says, I believe that's a continual tense there. It says, those who receive, it doesn't say had received, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. And I believe it's something we need. Daily, we need to receive grace. Remember that Old Testament scripture in Zechariah? It's, it talks about God finishing the temple with shouts of grace, grace to it. What's God trying to tell us there? He's saying that this thing started by grace, it's going to finish by grace. He says, I'm going to put the capstone on with shouts of grace, grace. But you know, so often Christians, we have this idea that, yeah, by grace I'm saved, but now I've got to work. God says, ah, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, this, this thing's going to finish with shouts of grace, grace to it. Isn't this a liberating message? There's nothing that you need to go out and do this week to make yourself any better. You can't improve on your nature. You already have the righteous nature of God. You don't have an old nature anymore. You don't have a sin nature dwelling in you. That was put on Jesus. You might have some memory of the sin nature and how things used to work under that old uh, system of failure and condemnation. We have the memory of that because, you know, we, we still have that mindset. But we don't have the old nature. How could you be in Christ and have the old nature? How could you be in Christ and have Satan's nature still dwelling in you? Impossible. The Bible says there's no fellowship between light and darkness. You can't have both dwelling together. You're either one or the other, but you're light in the Lord. You have the new nature. The old one was placed on Jesus. He took it away. He took it down to hell and paid the price for it. You and I are in Christ Jesus. Forgiven. God is never going to impute sin to your life ever, 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 ever. He's not going to do it. He's chosen to forget all your sin. Your sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. When God says I will... You know, there's no question about that. God always keeps his word. He says, I will not remember your sins. And he's talking about the sins that Jesus died for on the cross, not the ones that you're still yet to commit. 
He's looking back at the cross through the new covenant. He says, I will not remember your sins and lawless deeds. He spoke that before you even arrived. Isn't that amazing? Mm. Now, does this make you want to run out and go to the nightclub and sin? I don't think so. <laughs> might make you want to spend some time just worshipping God, saying, God, I never knew you were that awesome. Mm. <laughs> God, this good news really is good news. Mm. You know, this stuff really makes me tick. This stuff really gives me some confidence that, hey, I can enter my rest. I can be confident that, God, you've made me perfect. Yeah, there's some things about my life that are still going to improve, but that's nothing to do with my nature. My outworking, yes, there's some things I want to get better in and perfect and things like that, but it's nothing to do with who I am. That's just simply what I do. You know, it's just like these Olympic guys, you know, they're, they're, they're champions to the core, but they're going to still improve some of their skills and things like that and get better at what they do, but that doesn't change the fact they're a, they're a champion. You and I are champions. You know, the Bible says we're more than conquerors. We're overcomers. And I challenge you if, you, if you do something wrong and you fail or some kind of sin, I challenge you to focus on who you are. Even at that very moment when you disappointed yourself or disappointed God, I challenge you to confess out of your mouth, I am the righteousness of God. I am a child of the Most High God. My Father is pleased with me. He loves me and he has forgiven me. I challenge you to do that because that's the right response. That's coming to the throne of grace to receive mercy. Isn't that a little bit different from what we're used to? <laughs> oh yeah, we try, what, we've tried to go back under the law, thinking that the law was the way to fix it. No, it ain't. That'll just get you on a downward spiral. and There's no way out. It's miserable. You can't enjoy life. It's always the next day. Well, I'm going to improve tomorrow. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go on a fast. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to read the Bible more. And all these things are good. But just understand that those things aren't going to make you any better spiritually. You're already born again. You're already righteous. You can't improve on it. Hallelujah.